met some folks that were captive in Iran for a long time. One of them was a pastor from Idaho. And in very shortly, he will be filling his pulpit again. Amen. And there are others. I won't go into details. And uh, all of the merits of that, but God answers prayer. And I believe it's through prayer that ten sailors were prevented from being captive in Iran also. <coughs> we're living, folks, in perilous times, but we're living in momentous times when we see God move in various ways. And uh, I am excited about what God can do and what He's doing and what He's going to do. We're living at the time of the rapture of the church. The Bible said when you see all these things come to pass, look up, your redemption draws nigh. I want to share with you this morning from God's word from the book of 2 Samuel chapter 9 on the subject, the unmerited grace of God. That means we did not merit it. God, grace was extended to us by his own volition and will. I would like to take my scripture setting from 2 Samuel <coughs> chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. And David said, Is there yet any that is left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? There was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. When they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Are you Ziba? And he said, Your servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan has yet a son which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, He's in the house of Maker, the son of Emil, in Lodibar. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Maker, the son of Emil, from Lodibar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, Behold thy servant. David said unto him, Fear not, I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake and will restore you all the land of Saul your father and you shall eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, Oh, what is thy servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's <coughs> servant, and said unto him, I have given unto your master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. You therefore and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and you shall bring in the fruits that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son shall eat bread always at my table. 
Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so shall your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelled in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. Eternal Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for this privilege that you have given to me to stand before this body of your people and share the good things of God. And I pray that when we leave this place, Lord, that we will have received from your hand bountiful blessings. Keep us now, I pray, and keep me under the blood of Jesus. In thy precious name I pray. Amen and amen. Mephibosheth would never forget that day. Word quickly spread through the countryside. King Saul and Prince Jonathan are dead. And David has become king. At the house of Jonathan, this not only brought grief, but it brought panic as well. Because you see, in that day, it was customary that if a new king took the throne, the king would often eliminate all the family of the previous king. Sitting, playing on the floor was little Mephibosheth, oblivious to all that was taking place. And so, suddenly his nurse burst into the room, grabs him up and heads toward the door to run for safety. But in so doing, she drops him, crushing his ankles, crippling him for life. You see, he believed that there would never be a day that would so impact his life and so affect his future like that day. That day destined him for destitution, to live as a pauper instead of a prince. But Mephibosheth, would discover that soon there would come a day that would make far greater impact on his life and on his future. Consider with me the day he found grace. You know, for the devil, grace is a dirty word. Grace is the power behind the gospel. Not creed. Can you turn me down just a little bit? I don't want people to run out of it. <laughs> it's the gospel of grace. It's the wonder of the gospel that God would reach somebody like me. It's the distinction of the gospel no other religion is based upon such a concept. Grace. Grace is God's favor that is unearned, undeserved, and unrepayable. When Billy Graham 
was driving through a small southern town, he was stopped by a police officer and charged with speeding. Graham admitted his guilt, but was told by the officer that he would have to appear in court. The judge asked Graham, guilty or not guilty? When Billy Graham pleaded guilty, the judge replied, that'll be ten dollars. A dollar for every mile you went over the speed limit. Suddenly, the judge recognized the famous minister. You have violated the law, he said. The fine must be paid. But I am going to pay it for you. He took a $10 bill from his own wallet and attached it to the ticket. And then the judge took Graham out and bought him a steak dinner. <laughs> Billy Graham would later say that's how God treats repentant sinners. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. This concept is the key to the entirety of the New Testament. Amen. Too often we limit the work of salvation in our lives. But grace is the power yes. in our lives and for our lives. Notice with me grace. 2 Timothy 2.1 We are told be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Also in 1 Peter 4.10, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We are admonished in 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in grace. And lastly, Revelation 22.21, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. You see, Satan would have you leave the grace of God at the altar of salvation. But God's grace only starts there. His grace is in enriching and enabling our lives as we live for Him from day to day. The devil will tell you that from the point of salvation on, you must pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and make your way in your own strength. But grace is God's undeserved favor on our lives. David had just subdued his greatest enemies, the Philistines, the Moabites, and the Syrians. As he sat in his palace, looking back over his past, and how he had come from a sheepfold to a throne room. No doubt, David was taken by the wonder of God's grace in his own life. And I can't help but believe he began to look for a way that he could demonstrate the grace of God to someone that was just as unworthy of God's grace as he was. Verse 3 here tells us that I may show the kindness of God to him. Mephibosheth would become the recipients of David's act of grace. But my brother and sister, there is a deeper story here. You know, we read the Bible and we come across these stories and we read them and we say, yeah, I've read that again, you know, and I read it before and so on and so forth. But there's always good nuggets in the Word of God. It's like your favorite food. You eat and you eat. That's why we're like we are. The more we like it, the more we eat it. And that's the Word of God. The more you go over it, 
the more you get out of it and the more you like it. And as I was studying this message and getting ready for today, my wife didn't know it, but I was turning flip-flops in my soul as I was going over this message. And I was rejoicing in the Lord because I can see us here as Mephibosheth. This deeper story, the story of God's grace toward us, you and me. It reveals where we can find grace. First of all, grace will find you first. Amen. Yes. David asked, Is there not yet any of the household of Saul that I can show the kindness of God to him? You see, grace begins in the throne room. And it finds us. Like Mephibosheth, before we ever are aware of grace at all, grace has already, already begun seeking us. Did you know that? While we were yet in sin, He loved us. And he, he saw us out. You know that you cannot get salvation unless the Spirit draws you. Amen. So that's the grace of God seeking us out and drawing us. And then look with me. God's grace remembers us. <laughs> no reason to remember Mephibosheth forgotten by his nation and Abandoned by his family. But out of God's grace, David remembered this poor crippled man. All those around David were quick to remind him that Mephibosheth is crippled. As if that would turn David's heart in a different way. But David did not remember Mephibosheth because of what he could do for David. No use. David was motivated by pure grace. G. Campbell Morgan was approached by a miner one day who said he had trouble believing that he could just receive grace and Forgiveness, so easy. It's too cheap, he said. Dr. Morgan asked him if he worked in the mine today. He was a miner. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, I worked in the mine. How did you get out of the pit? Well, the way I usually do, by the way of the cage. Well, he said, how much did you pay to come out of the pit? He said, well, nothing. Dr. Graham said, weren't you afraid to trust in the cage since you paid nothing? Oh, no. He said it wasn't cheap. It cost the company a lot of money to seek that shaft. It was then. He saw the light and realized it had cost Christ Jesus a great price for the grace that is free to us. <laughs> Oh, hallelujah. That'll make you shout and nothing else will, brother. God's motivation to reach us is pure grace. God's grace pursues us. Grace will go wherever you are. You can't hide from God. You can't escape from God. Ask Jonah. He'll tell you. Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth was in Lodibar. Lodibar means no pasture, barren, desolate, a hiding place, a destitute place. But grace found him in Lodibar. As the prodigal son, grace found him in the pig pen and brought him back home. <laughs> Ask Joseph. Grace found him in a pit 
done for him by his brothers. And grace lifted him as high as second in command in the land of Egypt. Amen. Amen. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Ask the Samaritan woman. Grace found her at a well in the middle of the day. You see, like David, he sends out his messengers of grace. And no matter where you may be today, grace will find you and change your life. But great God's grace carries us. Mephibosheth could not help himself. He couldn't reach David if he had to. So David sent men to carry Mephibosheth. God's grace is dependent upon his ability and not my ability. Amen. Look at 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace, notice that, my grace, this is God speaking, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. My brother and sister, when you can't walk any further, let grace carry you. Amen. When you can't believe anymore, let grace believe for you. Yes. When you are weak, let his grace carry you. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Grace is where you abandon your crippled past. Amen. Well, isn't it something, isn't it strange how we common folk like to hold on to our difficulties and our weaknesses and our frailties, our crippledness. David had summoned Mephibosheth, but it was up to him to respond. Although grace is offered to us, it's up to us to embrace grace. But embracing grace means letting go of your crippled past and fling yourself upon God and trust in His grace. And then grace is where you abandon a crippled life. Not only was Mephibosheth <coughs> crippled in his feet, but his life had been crippled as well. Circumstances hindered him. His life was difficult. He could have been, let bitterness keep him in Lodabar, blaming David. He could have let fear keep him in Lodibar. You know why? Because David had the reputation of being a bloody man. God desires to trade your past for his presence. For his present and for his presence. Let go of it and take hold of God's grace this morning. And grace is where you abandon a crippled mentality. That's right. His handicap and his past left Mephibosheth feeling useless and worthless as he called himself a dead dog. Have you ever felt like that? I'm nothing. I'm like a dead dog. That's the way he felt. A crippled mentality. How transforming it must have been for him to realize he had value in the eyes of the king, not in the eyes of his neighbor or his family. He had value in the eyes of the king. <laughs> Hallelujah. When you awaken, and I awaken to the reality that he finds you precious and valuable to him. It just drives out.
that crippled mentality. Yes, it is. <laughs> he finds us precious. He created us. He formed us. He made us what we are. Notice with me that grace is where you discover who you were born to be. I'm going to go over that track again. Grace is where you discover who you were born to be. Maybe as a boy, Mephibosheth pretended what it would have been like had he been the royalty he was born to be. But time had taken those dreams away. My friend, we blame everything on Eve in the garden. But we lend ourselves to that, don't we, as human beings. The grace of God is wanting to lift us yes, to royalty today. Thank God for us who have yielded to that grace and find ourselves at the king's table. David looked down at him and restored his place in the palace. We too were born to be royalty in the kingdom of God. But sin dethroned us. We were born to be royalty in the kingdom of God, but sin dethroned us. We were born to have an intimate position. Not merely was Mephibosheth given the position of royalty, he was given the position of family. You know, that makes a difference. Notice verse 11, as one of the king's sons. In other words, David treated him no different than he treated his own sons. That's what it means. He had a position in family. God's grace won't just make us his servants or just the royal priesthood, but he makes us sons and daughters of Almighty God. I want you to know something this morning. I'm somebody. Amen. Whether you know it or not, whether you care or not, I'm somebody. I'm a king's kid. Right. Amen. Grace has placed me there. Nobody can take it away from me. Take it away from me. I've, hallelujah, I'm God's child. Hallelujah. Through grace that was extended to me. Hallelujah. Mephibosheth's position was a position of fellowship. Personal communion. Notice with me. He always had the king's ear. Always. And he every day ate what the king ate. Amen. <laughs> Let me tell you something, my brother and sister. I told him in the first service this morning I could hardly contain myself when I was going with this message. <laughs> Especially when I got to this point, we have a place at the king's table. Yes. Jesus. Hallelujah, that's royalty. Yes. By grace. And all we have to do to sit at the king's table is embrace grace. Yes. Amen. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. <laughs> That's called the grace oh, of God. And then we have a perpetual position. Yes. David made it clear that this position was no passing fancy. It was meant to be continual. That means forever. As long as David sat on the throne, 
Mephibosheth would never have to worry about anybody taking his royal seat away. We have his provision anytime we need it. Day or night, we have this position eternally. Grace is where you embrace God's favor at his son's expense. That's a jewel, and I've got to give it to you again. Grace is where you and I embrace God's favor at his son's expense. Hallelujah. You see, Mephibosheth wasn't receiving grace on the basis of what he had done, but on the basis of what Jonathan, his father, had done. Notice in verse 7, for Jonathan, your father's sake. In other words, Mephibosheth, if it hadn't been for your father, you wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> oh, if it weren't for Jesus... I wouldn't be here this morning. I wouldn't be at the king's table this morning. But Jesus made it all possible. We are receiving God's favor on the grounds of God's Son and His works. Grace has been called God's reward at Christ's expense. God's reward to us at Christ's expense. We must live our lives in the achievement of another. What do you mean by that, preacher? Well, you see, Mephibosheth lived in the grace his father paid the price for. We live in the grace that Jesus Christ yes, yes, paid the price for. In the abundance of his inheritance. In the favor of his only begotten son. Not on our merits, but on the merits of the master. Are you embracing God's grace this morning that he offers you? Let me tell you, His grace is seeking you. Whether you're a sinner or a saint, His grace. We carry burdens around as Christians even sometimes and, and, and we forget that God's grace is sufficient to carry us. Longing to leave her poor Brazilian neighborhood Christina wanted to see the world. She was discontent with a home which had only a pallet on the floor, a wash basin, and a wood-burning stove. Christina dreamed of a far better life in the city. One morning, she slipped away breaking her mother's heart. But knowing what life on the streets would be like for her very young, attractive daughter, Maria hurriedly packed <laughs> to go find Christina. On her way to the bus stop, she entered a drugstore to get one last thing pictures. She sat in that phone booth and closed the curtain around her and she spent all she could on pictures of herself. With her purse full of small black and white photos, she boarded the next bus to Rio de Janeiro. 
You see, Maria knew Christina had no way of earning money. She also knew that her daughter was just stubborn enough never to give up. You see, when pride meets hunger, a human will do things that were before unthinkable. And knowing this, Maria began her search. Bars, hotels, nightclubs, any place with a reputation for street walkers and prostitutes. She went to them all, and at each place, she left her picture taped to a bathroom mirror or tacked to a hotel bulletin board, maybe fastened to a corner phone booth. And on the back of each photo, she wrote a note. It wasn't too long before both the money and the pictures ran out. Maria had to return to her small village. It was a few weeks later that young Christina descended the hotel stairs. Her young face was tired. Her brown eyes no longer danced with youth, but spoke of pain and fear. Her laughter was broken. Her dream had become a nightmare. A thousand times over, she had longed to train, trade those countless bids for her secure pallet. Yet the little village was in too many ways too far away. As she reached the bottom of the stairs, her eyes noticed a familiar face. She looked again, and there, on the lobby mirror, was a small picture of her mother. Christina's eyes burned. Her throat tightened as she walked across the room and removed that small photo. Written on the back of that photo was this <laughs> compelling message. Whatever you've done, whatever you have become, it doesn't matter. Come home. She did. Oh, my friend, let me tell you, that's grace yes, pursuing you. Yes. If you do not know Jesus as your Savior, Brother Richard, you can know him this morning through his grace. But you have to come home. You have to come home to receive that grace. And if you are a believer... You find yourself in a place where you need His grace this morning. It's available for you as well. Saint or sinner, it's the grace of God. Grace of God will never turn His back on you. If you're in need of the Savior, if you have never asked Jesus, to forgive you of your sins and accept you as his child. Now is the time. Grace, grace, it's God's grace. Brother Richard, we're going to sing this song. I'd like you to close your eyes.